This chapter is called The Arrival, The Arrival of Latino Latino Studies, which is kind of interesting because we thought we were reading a whole book about Latino Latino Studies, and now it's just arriving. Chapter four, the first time it's arriving. And so let's talk about why, why it's arriving now. So Mize tells us that uh, there were two precursors, which we've actually been reading about and talking about two Latino studies, which, is, which were Puerto Rican studies and Chicano studies. So studies of people who were um, migrating in from Puerto Rico, mainly to New York and Chicago, as we saw, and people who were migrating into or had been born in this country or had the border crossed over them as we saw uh, from Mexico, uh, so Chicano studies. And then in this class, we have some stuff that happens to make this the arrival of Latino studies, so we'll just outline it. And so Dominican studies comes in, but kind of as, a, as, a, as an adjunct or a part of Puerto Rican studies, and Central American studies comes in, but kind of as a part of Mexican American or Chicano studies. And then Cuban American studies kind of comes in, but it's hard to do Cuban American studies for reasons that we'll talk about. And South American studies kind of comes in, but is pretty small. That's why they're in smaller fonts here. So those two didn't ever reach the kind of institutionalization of the, the big ones, you might say. And so what we're going to talk about is that, you know, Latino, Latino studies has arrived, but it's still often very much focused on a national, uh, a national origin group, not kind of the idea of uh, Latinos or Latinas in general. But at the end, we, he talks about how uh, sort of on the ground or in uh, relationship, uh, people are making uh, in certain places seem to be making this, what, he, what some people have called a pan-Latino or pan-ethnic uh, identity. So really kind of embodying that Latinidad because they are in relationship to others who are from different areas. So this is the outline of what we'll be, of what Mize talks about in this chapter and what we'll talk about in this class is how all of these things come in together. Um, I'd ask you to think as we're going along, uh, which group or groups do you find, have you, do you know the most about? And that is to say, maybe because uh, you identify with one of those groups or maybe because you've lived with around or have talked to people from this area. So we'll, at the end of class, I, as we're going along, you can think about, you know, which group you've known something about for whatever reason. And then at the end of class, we'll, I'll ask you to, to write that down and tell us about which group or group you know the most of, because we're finally getting to the point where we're sort of doing a huge overview of all the Latin American groups, people from Central North America, Central America and South America who, have, who, are, who are coming into the United States. So our first, uh, our, our first Dominican studies book uh, is uh, a book by Jorge Duany called Quisqueya on the Hudson, the transnational identity of Dominicans in Washington Heights, New York City. And it's a, it's a really interesting book. He doesn't get a pretty picture. He did such, such an old book, I guess, that they don't have a pretty picture for it anymore. Uh, he was studying a, a very quite large, in terms of, uh, of, of the, a Dominican community, first generation immigrants. It's the largest uh, grouping outside of the Dominican Republic. So the largest community of Dominicans outside of the, of the Dominican Republic. And what Duane was making the point of, he, he was trying to argue that these immigrants really were, um, were transnational. And uh, I got a picture of one of his, his later books that does have a prettier picture where he talks about transnational migration between the Hispanic Caribbean and the United States. And Duane himself 
was uh, in, in some ways transnational. He was born in Cuba, raised in Puerto Rico, uh, then was in the United States, is now the director of a Cuban Studies Institute in Florida. Um, so he himself has studied among Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, uh, now in some ways Cubans. Um, and so he was very fascinated, I think, with the idea of people being transnational of these new kinds of relationships and people wouldn't necessarily identify or assimilate that they would be going back and forth all the time. So he keeps using this word transnational. Uh, and so he was arguing that these, the Dominicans were resisting assimilation into mainstream society and they maintained a ton of connection with their home country. Now, in my opinion, I think Duane is too fascinated with the transnational and is in some ways kind of off about what would happen with the Dominican immigrants in, the, uh, in Washington Heights and elsewhere. And I probably would get in trouble with him or I'd have to have an argument with him if, if I were going to have this argument. But in my opinion, I think he and others at the time had an idealized notion or were contrasting Dominican immigration and uh, Caribbean immigration with uh, this other idea about what had happened with earlier European immigration. So if you remember, it's been a while, but I gave you a long time ago, seven truths about immigration. And one of my, the truths is, is that, you know, the first generation hardly ever, you know, they get some English experience, but it's only by the second or third generation. And by the third generation, uh, most immigrants are exclusively, are exclusively speaking uh, English and don't have anything of their uh, uh, native language. And so Duane here was studying first generation, recently arrived Dominican immigrants. Of course, they weren't necessarily going to be assimilating in terms of English speaking. If you look at their second generation and especially third generation uh, people who were raised in this country, you're going to see a, a very different uh, situation in terms of language use. The other thing that uh, I talked about is that we didn't know this before, but a lot of the European immigrants, like Italians and, and Germans and from other places, went back to Europe. They didn't intend to stay here, and a lot of them didn't stay here. And so this is something that, uh, again, we didn't really understand this before, and so we thought, oh, the European immigrants just came here and stayed, and these other people are coming in and then going back and forth. That's not true. The Europeans didn't necessarily want to stay here either. And uh, as again, I talked about, uh, you know, the people who were first generation from places like Italy didn't necessarily want to assimilate to the values of the United States. They want to maintain their home country language and values and all those things. It's only by, again, by the second or third generation that you have this massive imposition of, of US identity. So like I said, this is in my opinion that I think Duane overemphasized the idea that people were resisting assimilation and resisting or, or maintaining transnational ties. I don't think the Dominicans were necessarily any different than earlier and other European immigrants or anyone who comes in from uh, first generation, Asian, uh, Latin American, African, are going to be more tied to their home country uh, for a long time than they are to the United States. That said, a little bit later on uh, in the book, when they talk about some of the people who are, uh, who are studying Dominican immigrants, um, how to say, Dominicans immigrants in this country, as we've talked about, people often don't necessarily know uh, mainstream U.S. doesn't know what to do with uh, Latin Americans from the perspective of race. And so in the United States, we like to classify people often into either white or black. And so many Dominicans in this country become classified or racialized as black or African American. There's a really interesting book called Black Behind the Ears, Dominican Racial Identity from Museums to Beauty to beauty shops, which is talking about this kind of, of uh, 
of identity and, and the ways in which people are trying to negotiate. So the fact that Dominicans were racialized in the United States as being black and not white is a particular problem if you were raised in the Dominican Republic. And that's because in some ways, the Dominican Republic was ruled by a dictator called Rafael Trujillo, who was obsessed with the idea that the country needed to be white. So he did a lot of bad things to try and promote whiteness uh, at the time. There is some rumor that he himself may have had some African ancestry and that's why he was so obsessed with, uh, with, um, with whitening the country. But it also has to do with the situation of the Dominican Republic in relationship to Haiti. I've talked about Haiti a little bit, the, the place uh, that is often left out of Latin American studies because uh, they speak French and, and Creole. Uh, but, you know, it's a hugely important country in terms of being the second independent country in the Americas, the first independent country in the Caribbean and Latin America, but has always had a tense relationship with the other side of the island. This is the island that was once called Hispaniola, the place where Columbus first landed. Um, so on the one side was the, the French colony and the, on the, other, the other side, the Spanish colony. And the identity of being Dominican often uh, became being not Haitian because there'd be immigrants from Haiti into the Dominican Republic and Trujillo was very concerned about that. Other people have been very, very, uh, more than concerned, very, very uh, brutal uh, to the, the Haitians who are working in, say, sugarcane production in the Dominican, Dominican Republic. So what this is to say is that the identity of being Dominican was often had a lot to do with saying, well, I'm not Haitian and I'm not black because Haiti is, of course, associated a lot with blackness. And so what I'm trying to say here is one can understand why if Dominicans were coming into the United States, given this national history and given this identity, that they might be not so happy about then being classified or looked at as black in the United States. Um, because as Mai said, it's, it's estimated that up to 90% of, uh, of Dominicans have direct African, African ancestry, an enslaved African ancestor. And as we know in this country, if that's true, uh, we have different rules for classifying people and we would say that those people are black. So um, again, this is to say that people might not have wanted to be racialized or accept the identity rules uh, that the United States was trying to hand out. So some really interesting and important studies from uh, of Dominican immigrants, again, because of the way in which, uh, in which geography and, and the studies work, these were often uh, put together with studies of Puerto Ricans and so became part of Puerto Rican studies. The other thing that starts to happen, especially, and now we're turning into the Southwest, especially around uh, Los Angeles, is you had uh, migrants coming in uh, from El Salvador and Guatemala. And so uh, important book here by Norma Hamilton and Norma Stoltz Chinchilla, Seeking Community, Guatemalans and Salvadorans in Los Angeles. Um, and so what was happening here is that uh, the countries of Central America in the 1950s, 1960s, but then especially in the 1970s, uh, there were some pretty brutal uh, political regimes in, in Guatemala and El Salvador, uh, a lot of uh, right-wing uh, death squads. And so people began to flee these areas because of the violence of the civil war. What was interesting is that there were also similar things going on in Honduras and also in Nicaragua. But Nicaragua had a both a civil war and a, a kind of a revolution in which they uh, a, a socialist regime came to power. And so uh, Ronald Reagan and the United States in general was at that time opposed to socialist regimes, but supported the 
kind of right-wing regimes of Guatemala and El Salvador. And so people from all of these countries would show up in the United States basically fleeing the civil wars and the, and the problems that were happening there. For the Nicaraguans, because they were seen as fleeing socialism, they were like, okay, cool, you guys can be political refugees. We'll welcome you. But for Guatemalans and Salvadorans, the US said, well, we are, we're supporting your government, so you can't have a political problem. You must just be here because you want a job. And so they were much less supportive of the people who were coming in from Guatemala and El Salvador. This is, in some ways, uh, this is still playing out on the southern border today. When you hear about Central American migrants coming through, that seems to be one of the, and, and asking for asylum, this is still a result of some of these, uh, of some of these political regimes and, and repression that has happened in these areas. But the United States is, how to say, this question tripped a lot of you up on the quiz. We tend to like political refugees. That is to say, when you think about, so let's say for Afghanistan right now, like people are like, we have to take in the Afghanis that helped us because they're seen as being political allies. So the people that were helping uh, US, uh, the US forces and the US cause in Afghanistan we want to take them in and do the right thing. So as long as you're a political refugee, that's okay. But the United States tends to be very down on people who we think of as economic migrants, that they're here because they're poor or they're here because they want a job. Those people we tend to say, no, we, should, we shouldn't, shouldn't help those people. And so we try to ship them back. Like the Haitians that showed up on the Texas border we tried to ship most of them back. So this interesting thing develops uh, in this area where certain people uh, fleeing similar situations were classified as political refugees and got political asylum, but other people were just classified, were classified as economic migrants. And one of the interesting results of this was called the sanctuary movement. You may have heard recently these this idea that you know um, some politicians are are against this idea of sanctuary cities and sanctuary states um but what's interesting is the sanctuary movement actually developed out of biblical ideas and churches who said well the law is being misapplied here there are political you know these people are facing political repression and the church should be a place of refuge or sanctuary for those people. So there was a, an interesting uh, movement here that was rooted again in this kind of interpretation of scripture, biblical stuff and churches uh, that came up uh, out of this time. Now being uh, in some ways blasted uh, for too biblical, I guess. So uh, we have uh, Central Americans coming most, mostly into the Los Angeles area. The other thing that happens is, uh, is the, the Cuban revolution, the rise of Castro. Uh, and so there's a large, a fairly large exodus of Cubans from, uh, from, from that area who settle mostly in Miami. And this is a, be again, because of the U.S. positions towards socialism and communism and its anti-Castro status, uh, the first wave of Cuban refugees were really supported by, uh, there was actually an operation, it's called Operation Peter Pan, that actually flew out uh, the children from Cuba to try and, uh, the rich people were trying to, to get them out uh, before Castro did something to them, who thought they, were, they thought they were going to be re-educated. And so the first wave of Cuban immigrants were more people who, were, who felt threatened by the Cuban revolution. Business owners um, tended to be uh, of a, a, a higher social class status, and they were really welcomed and funded uh, into the United States and caused a, a pretty 
strange dynamic in Florida where they formed a very conservative uh, political association, which basically supported whichever political party was going to be harshest to Cuba. And so when you look at the voting situation in Florida and you wonder well, what, what are they, why are they all supporting these hardcore Republican candidates? It is often because uh, they are taking up a hard line stance uh, towards Cuba and that's really all they want to do. Now, as Maya says, this changes a little bit in the second and third generation because people stop to care so much, but it's still a pretty strong influence and has a, a lot to do with the ways in which uh, Cubans uh, are incorporated into this country, but also how they get studied. It becomes difficult to do Cuban studies in part because this community is so active. They don't want people studying in Cuba. They don't want that seen as supporting the Castro regime. And so it becomes a very politicized uh, study, which kind of limits the, the amount in which people are, are able to do this. So you have Cuban immigrants coming in, a small amount of Cuban studies, but not a huge Cuban studies thing. We also have, uh, getting toward the end of the chapter, the arrival of sort of South American studies. What are called the other Latinos or even the other, other Latinos. So on the census, uh, most Latinos, they ask for people who are Mexican, Puerto Rican or Cuban, and then they lump everybody else into the others. Um, and especially the people from South America, this is probably the smallest group of immigrants, but they come from, uh, from uh, nine different countries. And um, what's interesting here is that many of these countries, and, and Mai says this, uh, the people who are immigrating are in general, on average, uh, wealthier and sometimes middle class. And that's because uh, some of these people are coming from countries that themselves are, are fairly wealthy or middle class, uh, such as Argentina, Chile, Uruguay. We saw a picture of, uh, of uh, Eduardo Galeano, uh, very heavily uh, European immigration into those places and, and in general uh, wealthier places. So some of these places uh, make it so that the South American populations that come into this country are wealthier. I will say though, that's not necessarily true of different places that come into, uh, into the United States. So for me, uh, and this is a book by uh, uh, actually one of, uh, a colleague of mine, but who teaches in, in Washington state, uh, who did a study of uh, Ecuadorians uh, in both Ecuador and in New York City. And um, New York City and the surrounding area is home to uh, one of the largest Ecuadorian populations outside of Ecuador. I think if, if the Ecuadorian population in New York City were totaled up, it would be the, the third largest Ecuadorian city in the world outside of Quito and Guayaquil. And certainly the Ecuadorians are not necessarily uh, in these, this situation of other South American immigrants of being uh, on average wealthier and middle class. And so there's been a pretty, there's a lot of difference here between being say from Ecuador, or Par um, Paraguay, Bolivia or Peru versus some of those other uh, Southern cone countries. And this is, uh, like I said, this is one of the reasons that I became kind of fascinated with, uh, with Latino, uh, Immigration is because you know, I did my own studies in Ecuador and Colombia, and you kind of see this, uh, this migration into uh, places like New York City and New Jersey. So um, we have the South American studies that starts to be done, but as Vice says, there's not, there's not any center of South American studies. There's not a, a place that is, uh, is particularly devoted to that, in part because it's a small, population. So we then get to um, what Mayas finally calls the arrival of Latino or Latino studies um, and a number of books that have come out fairly recently that try to make sense of this in terms of 
uh, Latino or Latina studies. Uh, for Mize, he says that the problem still is that too often a lot of these are about one particular country or nation origin group. So this book, the Latino Condition, he says is very specific to Mexican Americans. And that the Hispanic spaces, Latina places, was also Mexican centric. And this book, Latino, Latina Thought, does expand their focus to Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans, but is still perhaps too centered on a certain kind of group. And in part, this is because there is um, the, the impetus for Latin American studies has come from these groups themselves. It wasn't as, as Mize put it, it wasn't a cerebral exercise from the academy. So it wasn't that someone was sitting around and saying, hey, who should we study from the university? It was a demand from the people themselves that they be included in university or college studies or academic studies. And so it's a, it's a very different experience, say, than being uh, an anthropologist who generally comes from a place where they're trying to go to, to study other people and people themselves demanding inclusion uh, in the university or in the college. And we've talked about this in terms of the political demands of movements like the Young Lords and the Puerto Rican movement that are demanding this kind of access to education. At the end of this chapter, Mice talks about something that I think is super interesting uh, to, to me and I think to, to everybody kind of thinking about where this is all going to go. Um, so you have uh, different groups coming into this country. They've generally been studied and identify as their own national origin. But to what extent are people starting to develop this sense of themselves as Latino, uh, as, as this book is called, Latino pan-ethnicity? The idea that in a place like Queens, people from different Latin American groups are interacting shopping at each other's stores, maybe getting married to each other, maybe having children. So they talk about uh, places where there's Mexicans, Dominicans. We've talked a little bit about this, that in some ways, some of this is happening on the ground to create this idea of a, of a pan-ethnic Latino identity rather than simply one that is rooted in uh, an origin country. So I think this is super interesting. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Will it continue? Will people uh, start to develop that sense of being Latino as a pan-ethnicity, or will they kind of fade into different categories the United States has had? There's another book that popped up for me called the Latino Latino Midwest. And again, this has to do with a lot, one of the themes of this class is places where you wouldn't necessarily expect to find people identifying as Latino or Latino. A lot of this has been recent immigration and migrations and movements, but it's making new spaces for this kind of identification. So, you know, in general, we've associated New York City with Puerto Ricans, Miami with Cubans, the Southwest with Mexicans. But now I think that things are, are, are changing and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. So we get to, at this point, a kind of turning point, I would say, of the book, where we now see all the people, all the people that have, uh, have contributed to uh, Latin American stuff. 